Hello hackers! Welcome to Hacker 101 iOS App Transport Basics. In this module, we'll review the protections Apple provides out of the box for an app's network traffic, and you'll learn to identify ways that an app might weaken those default controls. You'll also learn how to configure a device to capture an application's traffic. The demos and exercises in this module do require an iOS device to follow along. I'll be using a jailbroken device in the video, but you can also use a jailed device if you follow the instructions we have provided. Apple provides protection for an app's network connections through a feature called App Transport Security, or ATS. ATS was initially rolled out in iOS 9 and applies when the URL loading system is used, so it applies for higher level classes like NSURL session, but not lower level interfaces like CF Network. ATS enforces a set of rules for connections to remote host names to ensure they meet minimum security requirements. The most obvious of these is the requirement that connections use HTTPS. By default, iOS apps are not allowed to make unencrypted HTTP connections to host names. You'll notice that I mentioned host names several times. ATS has an interesting nuance. It does not apply to connections to IP addresses. So an app can legitimately connect insecurely to an IP address, and ATS will not prevent it. It is important to understand that ATS operates based on the iOS SDK that the app is linked against, not the OS version on which the app is running. Apps that link to very old SDKs will not be protected, even if they run on the newest version of iOS. ATS ensures that TLS certificates prevented by servers adhere to minimum security requirements as well. The anchor certificate in the certificate chain must be a root that iOS trusts, or a certificate installed and trusted by the user. There are also some minimum requirements around the certificate signature, which are important if you plan to use a proxy to intercept traffic. You'll need to ensure that your proxy's CA certificate meets these requirements. Although ATS is enabled by default, apps can make exceptions in their info.plist file under the NS App Transport Security key. However, exceptions that substantially weaken the security of network connections have to be justified to Apple during the App Store review process. When analyzing an application, there are a few keys to watch for that may indicate that network security has been weakened. NS allows arbitrary loads is the most impactful when used alone. It effectively disables ATS globally for the app. However, it can also be used to provide backwards compatibility for running on iOS 9, which had less granularity for exceptions. To allow for this, NS allows arbitrary loads is ignored by newer versions of iOS when used in conjunction with other global exception keys that start with NS allows. One such global exception key is NS allows arbitrary loads in web content. An app that sets this key to true turns off ATS only for embedded browser objects known as web views but ATS will remain in force for other connections. If this key is used in conjunction with NS allows arbitrary loads, then ATS will be fully disabled on iOS 9 to allow backwards compatibility, but on iOS 10 and up, ATS will only be disabled for web views. Finally, we have NS exception domains. This allows a custom ATS configuration to be set for a domain. This can allow an app to have full ATS protections on its own endpoints while disabling ATS for third-party endpoints, for example. Two keys to watch for in exception dictionaries are NS exception allows insecure HTTP loads, which allows unencrypted HTTP connections, and NS exception minimum TLS version, which permits a server to use a less secure version of TLS. As a reminder, disabling ATS does not mean that the application will, for instance, be permitted to accept invalid certificates. Certificate validation is a separate function that isn't directly affected by ATS protections. When ATS is disabled, unencrypted HTTP connections to host names are allowed, and the application is permitted to weaken certificate validation, for instance, by accepting self-signed certificates. Now that you have a good idea of what is possible with ATS, let's take a look at some real-world examples of ATS configurations. I'm displaying a portion of the info.plist file here from an App Store application. The application has the NS App Transport Security key configured with several global exceptions. The first thing that probably catches your eye is the inclusion of NS allows arbitrary loads. If this were the only key set to true in the dictionary, ATS would be globally disabled for the app. But since other global exception keys are set, this will be ignored on iOS 10 and up and will only disable ATS on iOS 9. On iOS 10 and up, the other keys will be honored. 
First, ATS will be disabled in media loads that use Apple's AV Foundation framework. ATS will also be disabled in web views. The last key is interesting. NS allows local networking doesn't actually disable anything on iOS 10 and up. It is only provided for the purpose of telling newer versions of iOS to ignore the NS allows arbitrary loads key, although Apple also recommends including it to declare the application's intent to connect to unqualified domains, .local domains, and IP addresses. Let's look at one more real-world example. This application is using NS exception domains to set custom policies for three domains. All other host names would be subject to the default ATS policy. For each specified domain, the requirement for forward secrecy is disabled, and the policy is applied to the domain and all of its subdomains. This is a common pattern when an application needs to connect to endpoints owned by a third party that do not meet the default ATS requirements. An important aspect to examining any application is analyzing the data it sends and receives on the network. Proxying an iOS application is a little bit different than proxying with a browser, mostly due to the additional steps required to establish the certificate as trusted. Let's walk through the process of installing and trusting a CA certificate from Burp Suite as an example. I've already connected my jailbroken iPad to my computer over USB and started my Burp proxy on localhost port 8080. I want to show you a trick you can use when working with a jailbroken device that is running an SSH server. First, I'm going to run iProxy in the background to forward traffic from port 2222 on my laptop over the USB connection to port 22 on my iPad. This will allow me to SSH to the device by connecting to localhost colon 2222 on my laptop. Then, I'm going to set up a reverse SSH tunnel to forward connections from port 8080 on the device to port 8080 on my laptop. This will allow my device to connect to localhost 8080 on the device, and the traffic will be tunneled over the USB connection to the proxy port. Why would you want to set up your proxy this way? Well, if you are on a network that doesn't allow connections between hosts, or you are having trouble maintaining a stable over-the-air connection between your device and your proxy, tunneling over SSH is a good solution. Once my tunnel is set up, I'll navigate to the settings on my device and set my proxy to localhost 8080. The next step is downloading Burp's certificate. I'll use Safari right on the device to download the certificate. iOS will then direct me back to the Settings app to finish the installation. First, go to General, Profile, and click on the downloaded profile. You can see that it shows up as not verified. Click Install, then Install again when prompted. The certificate now reports that it is verified. Despite that, we aren't done yet. To get the device to treat the certificate like any other trusted root certificate, we have to perform one more step. First, navigate to General, About, Certificate Trust Settings. The certificate we just installed is listed. I'll flip the toggle to enable full trust and click Continue when prompted. At this point, I should be able to see application traffic in the proxy. Now let's say you've performed all those steps and you still aren't seeing any traffic in the proxy. You might be encountering a security measure known as certificate pinning. When an application pins a certificate, it compares the certificate presented by the server to the known values for the pinned certificate. There are different ways this can be done. For instance, the app might compare the whole certificate, a public key, or even just pin the CA certificate instead of the leaf certificate. This works very well to protect against a hostile endpoint or a man-in-the-middle attack. It can be bypassed at runtime on a jailbroken device or by tampering with the application before installing it. The specifics of the bypass typically depend on the version of iOS, but can also depend on any custom network frameworks and libraries the application uses. There are two schools of thought on bypass and pinning. One is to install a broad bypass that affects the device as a whole. The SSL kill switch package for jailbroken devices is a popular option for bypassing pinning in this manner. The advantage is that you don't have to think about it. You install it and turn it on and you're done. The disadvantage is that you might bypass protections for traffic unnecessarily, and depending on your use of the device, you may compromise your own security. My own preference is a more targeted option that bypasses pinning on a per-process basis. One way to do this is by using a Frida script that targets the correct version of iOS. If you recall, 
Frida enables us to inject JavaScript into the application at runtime to manipulate it. We can use it on a jailbroken device, but if we have an unencrypted copy of the application, we can also use it on a jailed device as well. Let's take a look at an example. I once again have my iPad connected to my computer via USB, and I've launched the App Store app while my iPad is configured to use a proxy. As you can see, the app is refusing to connect to the proxy. It recognizes that the certificates presented are not valid. To bypass this, I'm going to use a script from Frida CodeShare that targets the network APIs on iOS 13. Once it is loaded, I'll hit retry in the app. And now it loads content from the network. If I exit the Frida CLI, it will revert the bypass and once again, I won't be able to load any content from the network in the app. Now that we can bypass pinning, we should be all set, right? Not so fast. What if we still aren't seeing any traffic? Up until now, we've relied on the system proxy settings to direct app traffic to the proxy. However, some apps are simply not proxy aware. The popular Flutter framework is a good example. By default, it is not proxy aware unless the app developer adds support for proxy. In these cases, we have got to get the traffic to the proxy ourselves. How you do this very much depends on what tools you have at your disposal. One common way is to run a hotspot on your computer and connect your device to it. Use something like IP tables to forward traffic from the device IP to your proxy's listener. The proxy will need to be run in transparent mode, which means the app does not need to know it is talking to the proxy. You'll still need to set up the proxy certificate on the device and trust it. Although this will not be a common scenario when examining applications, it is a good idea to try this out so you will know how to make it work with your specific computer and operating system. Once you are successfully capturing traffic, you can test the app's endpoints much like you would any other remote server. There are a few things to watch for that can be particularly interesting in the context of mobile applications. One is traffic that is sent to third parties, particularly ad and analytics frameworks. Since mobile devices tend to store and process very specific private information about the user, third parties may have more access to gather private information like GPS location, personally identifiable information, and data the application might otherwise have permission to access. Be mindful of not only the nature of the data sent to third parties, but the frequency. A third party that gathers location data every few seconds is worth further examination. HTTP traffic is another red flag, especially since Apple works pretty hard to make clear text network communications hard to do. Besides leaking confidential information, consider how the application uses any data received over in insecure channels and whether modifying that data could impact the application's security. Finally, pay attention to what certificates are accepted by the application. In a browser, you will typically see a clear warning when a server certificate isn't valid, but in an application, those errors are not usually surfaced to the user. When invalid certificates are silently accepted, a man-in-the-middle attack is much easier. Watch for application traffic in your proxy before you install and trust the CA certificate. This is a sign that the application isn't performing sufficient certificate validation. You can also try configuring your proxy to generate certificates with a static incorrect host name to see if the application will accept it. You now know the tools and techniques to successfully capture application traffic on iOS and what to look for to determine if the application is applying sufficient transport security. Don't miss the final module of the series, where you'll learn about iOS web views and the tools you can use to trace their behavior and look for weaknesses. Until then, happy hacking!